Section 3 of the Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant. Translated by Thomas Kingsmill Abbott. Section 3. First Part. Elements of Pure Practical Reason. Book 1. The Analytic of Pure Practical Reason. Chapter 1. Of the Principles of Pure Practical Reason. Theorem 3. A rational being cannot regard his maxims as practically universal laws, unless he conceives them as principles which determine the will, not by their matter, but by their form only. By the matter of a practical principle, I mean the object of the will. This object is either the determining ground of the will, or it is not. In the former case, the rule of the will is subjected to an empirical condition, viz., the relation of the determining idea to the feeling of pleasure and pain. Consequently, it cannot be a practical law. Now when we abstract from a law all matter, i.e., every object of the will, as a determining principle. Nothing is left but mere form of a universal legislation. Therefore, either a rational being cannot conceive his subjective practical principles, that is, his maxims, as being at the same time universal laws, or he must suppose that their mere form, by which they are fitted for universal legislation, is alone what makes them practical laws. Remark. The commonest understanding can distinguish, without instruction, what form of maxim is adapted for universal legislation, and what is not. Suppose, for example, that I have made it my maxim to increase my fortune by every safe means. Now I have a deposit in my hands, the owner of which is dead and has left no writing about it. This is just the case for my maxim. I desire then to know whether the maxim can also bold good as a universal practical law. I apply it, therefore, to the present case, and ask whether it could take the form of a law, and consequently whether I can, by my maxim at the same time, give such a law as this, that everyone may deny a deposit of which no one can produce a proof. I at once become aware that such a principle viewed as a law, would annihilate itself, because the result would be that there would be no deposits. A practical law, which I recognize as such, must be qualified for universal legislation. This is an identical proposition, and therefore self-evident. Now if I say that my will is subject to a practical law, I cannot adduce my inclination, e.g., in the present case my avarice, as a principle of determination fitted to be a universal practical law. For this is so far from being fitted from a universal legislation, that, if put in the form of a universal law, it would destroy itself. It is therefore surprising that intelligent men could have thought of calling the desire of happiness a universal practical law on the ground that the desire is universal, and therefore also the maxim by which every one makes his desire determine his will. For whereas in other cases a universal law of nature makes everything harmonious, here, on the contrary, if we attribute to the maxim the universality of a law, the extreme opposite of harmony will follow, the greatest opposition and the complete destruction of the maxim itself and its purpose. For in that case the will of all has not one and the same object, but every one has his own, his private welfare, which may accidentally accord with the purposes of others, which are equally selfish. But it is far from sufficing for a law, because the occasional exceptions which one is permitted to make are endless, and cannot be definitely embraced in one universal rule. In this manner, then, results a harmony like that which a certain satirical poem depicts as existing between a married couple bent on going to ruin. O oh, marvelous harmony, what he wishes, she wishes also. Or like what is said of the pledge of Francis I to the Emperor Charles V, 
what my brother Charles wishes, that I wish also. Viz. Milan. Empirical principles of determination are not fit for any universal external legislation, but just as little for internal, for each man makes his own subject the foundation of his inclination, and in the same subject sometimes one inclination, sometimes another, has the preponderance. To discover a law which would govern them all under this condition, namely, bringing them all into harmony, is quite impossible. 5. Problem 1. Supposing that the mere legislative form of maxims is alone the sufficient determining principle of a will, to find the nature of the will which can be determined by it alone, since the bare form of the law can only be conceived by reason, and is, therefore, not an object of the senses, and consequently does not belong to the class of phenomena, it follows that the idea of it, which determines the will, is distinct from all the principles that determine events in nature according to the law of causality, because in their case the determining principles must themselves be phenomena. Now if no other determining principle can serve as a law for the will except that universal legislative form, such a will must be conceived as quite independent of the natural law of phenomena in their mutual relation, namely, the law of causality. Such independence is called freedom in the strictest, that is, in the transcendental sense. Consequently, a will which can have its law in nothing but the mere legislative form of the maxim is a free will. 6. Problem 2. Supposing that a will is free to find the law which alone is competent to determine it necessarily, since the matter of the practical law, i.e., an object of the maxim, can never be given otherwise than empirically, and the free will is independent on empirical conditions, that is, conditions belonging to the world of sense, and yet is determinable, consequently, a free will must find its principle of determination in the law, and yet independently of the matter of the law. But besides the matter of the law, nothing is contained in it except the legislative form. It is the legislative form, then, contained in the maxim, which can alone constitute a principle of determination of the free will. Remark. Thus freedom and an unconditional practical law reciprocally imply each other. Now I do not ask here whether they are in fact distinct, or whether an unconditioned law is not merely the consciousness of a pure practical reason, and the latter identical with the positive concept of freedom. I only ask, whence begins our knowledge of the unconditionally practical, whether it is from freedom or from the practical law? Now it cannot begin from freedom, for of this we cannot be immediately conscious, since the first concept of it is negative, nor can we infer it from experience, for experience gives us the knowledge only of the law of phenomena, and hence of the mechanism of nature, the direct opposite of freedom. It is therefore the moral law of which we become directly conscious, as soon as we trace for ourselves maxims of the will, that first presents itself to us, and leads directly to the concept of freedom, inasmuch as reason presents it as a principle of determination, not to be outweighed by any sensible conditions, nay, wholly independent of them. But how is the consciousness of that moral law possible? We can become conscious of pure practical laws, just as we are conscious of pure theoretical principles, by attending to the necessity with which reason prescribes them, and to the elimination of all empirical conditions, which it directs. The concept of a pure will arises out of the former, as that of a pure understanding arises out of the latter. That this is the true subordination of our concepts, and that it is morality that first discovers to us the notion of freedom. Hence that it is a practical reason which, with this concept, first proposes to speculative reason the most insoluble problem, thereby placing it in the greatest perplexity, is evident from the following consideration. Since nothing in phenomena can be explained by the concept of freedom, but the mechanism of nature must constitute the only clue, moreover, 
when pure reason tries to ascend in the series of causes to the unconditioned it falls into autonomy which is entangled in incomprehensibilities on the one side as much as the other whilst the latter namely mechanism is at least useful in the explanation of phenomena therefore no one would ever have been so rash as to introduce freedom into science had not the moral law and with it practical reason come in and force this notion upon us experience however confirms this order of notions suppose someone asserts of his lustful appetite that when the desired object and the opportunity are present it is quite irresistible ask him if a gallows were erected before the house where he finds this opportunity and order that he should be hanged thereon immediately after the gratification of his lust whether he could not then control his passion we need not be long in doubt what he would reply ask him however if his sovereign ordered him on pain of the same immediate execution to bear false witness against an honorable man whom the prince might wish to destroy under plausible pretext would he consider it possible in that case to overcome his love of life however great it may be he would perhaps not venture to affirm whether he would do so or not but he must unhesitatingly admit that it is possible to do so he judges therefore that he can do a certain thing because he is conscious that he ought and he recognizes that he is free a fact which but for the moral law he would have never known seven fundamental law of the pure practical reason act so that the maxim of thy will can always at the same time hold good as a principle of universal legislation remark pure geometry has postulates which are practical propositions but contain nothing further than the assumptions that we can do something if it is required that we should do it and these are the only geometrical propositions that concern actual existence they are then practical rules under a problematical condition of the will but here the rule says we absolutely must proceed in a certain manner the practical rule is therefore unconditional and hence it is conceived a priori as a categorically practical proposition by which the will is objectively determined absolutely and immediately by the practical rule itself which thus in this case a law for pure reason practical of itself is here directly legislative the will is thought as independent on empirical conditions and therefore as pure will determined by the mere form of the law and this principle of determination is regarded as the supreme condition of all maxims the thing is strange enough and has no parallel in all the rest of our practical knowledge for the priori thought of a possible universal legislation which is therefore merely problematical is unconditionally commanded as a law without borrowing anything from experience or from any external will this however is not a precept to do something by which some desired effect can be attained for then the will would depend on physical conditions but a rule that determines the will a priori only so far as regards the forms of its maxims and thus it is at least not impossible to conceive that a law which only applies to the subjective form of principles yet serves as a principle of determination by means of the objective form of law in general we may call the consciousness of this fundamental law a fact of reason because we cannot reason it out from the antecedent data of reason e g the consciousness of freedom for this is not antecedently given but it forces itself on us as a synthetic a priori proposition which is not based on any intuition either pure or empirical it would indeed be analytical if the freedom of the will were presupposed but to presuppose freedom as a positive concept would require an intellectual intuition which cannot here be assumed however when we regard this law as given it must be observed in order not to fall into any misconception that it is not an empirical fact but the sole fact of the pure reason which thereby announces itself as originally legislative sic volo sic jubio corollary pure reason is practical of itself alone 
and gives to man a universal law which we call the moral law. Remark. The fact just mentioned is undeniable. It is only necessary to analyze the judgment that men pass on the lawfulness of their actions in order to find that whatever inclination may say to the contrary reason, incorruptible and self-constrained, always confronts the maxim of the will in any action with the pure will, that is, with itself, considering itself as a priori practical. Now this principle of morality, just on account of the universality of the legislation, which makes it the formal supreme determining principle of the will, without regard to any subjective differentes, is declared by the reason to be a law for all rational beings in so far as they have a will, that is, a power to determine their causality by the conception of rules, and therefore, so far as they are capable of acting according to principles, and consequently, also according to practical a priori principles, for these alone have the necessity that reason requires in a principle. It is therefore not limited to men only, but applies to all finite beings that possess reason and will. Nay, it even includes the infinite being as the supreme intelligence. In the former case, however, the law has the form of an imperative, because in them, as rational beings, we can suppose a pure will, but being creatures affected with wants and physical motives, not a holy will, that is, one which would be incapable of any maxim conflicting with the moral law. In their case, therefore, the moral law is an imperative, which commands categorically, because the law is unconditioned, the relation of such a will to this law is dependence under the name of obligation, which implies a constraint to an action though only by reason in its objective law, and this action is called duty, because an elective will subject to pathological affections, though not determined by them, and therefore still free, implies a wish that arises from subjective causes, and therefore may often be opposed to the pure objective determining principle, whence it requires the moral constraint of a resistance of the practical reason which may be called an internal but intellectual compulsion. In the supreme intelligence, the elective will is rightly conceived as incapable of any maxim, which could not at the same time be objectively a law, and the notion of holiness, which on that account belongs to it, places it, not indeed above all practical laws, but above all practically restrictive laws, and consequently above obligation and duty. The holiness of will is, however, a practical idea, which must necessarily serve as a type to which finite rational beings can only approximate indefinitely, and which the moral law, which is itself on this account called holy, constantly and rightly holds before their eyes. The utmost that finite practical reason can effect is to be certain of this indefinite progress of one's maxims and of their steady disposition to advance. This is virtue, and virtue, at least as a naturally acquired faculty, can never be perfect, because assurance in such a case never becomes apodictic certainty, and when it only amounts to persuasion, is very dangerous. End of section 3 Recording by Andrea Fiore End of The Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant Translated by Thomas Kingsmill Abbott